Yep, there you go. You're on live now? Yes. Okay, great. Well, uh, it's 7.33. It's Monday night chat with Wong Chen. That's me. Brought to you by my office. It says, in collaboration with Invoke. And today, we will talk a lot about Invoke later. Yeah. So let's start off with a bit of songs, a bit of music. And tonight, our special guest star is uh, none other than Nadira again and Abigail. So, yeah, voices are not that good, but we'll try. Okay. Show me how to do the da 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 how would you define that kind of music? Oh, it's just voice, right? Acapella? Acapella? Okay, thank you. So, You're welcome. we go into previously in Kalana Jaya. <laughs> uh, this week, we have five topics. Wow. Uh, wow, that's quite a lot. This is the Very new record for us. Boss. That's right. Because uh, when we go into Policy Monday, I think we're going to have a very short one instead. So let's talk about five basic things that we, we uh, that happened sort of last week. The most important, of course, we started with Trump uh, winning the U.S. election. So um, I wrote a short uh, commentary on the matter. It's been circulated quite widely, and uh, it was even picked up by the by FMT, Free Malaysia Today, right? Hey. Yeah. So they reported on it. So I would like to talk about Trump. I would like to also talk about the Invoke dinner. A bit of a plug for Invoke. Uh, then I'd like to talk about the, the debates that I've taken, that I have done in Parliament last uh, last week and today. And then about my human rights conference in Bali. That was a bit of a break for me. And then lastly, today's uh, trial, which was Rafizi Ramli sentenced to 18 months, uh, two, two terms. Okay, let's start with Trump. So what does a, a Trump victory mean for Malaysia? Now, uh, you know, I, I, I predicted that Trump is going to win quite some time ago, about nine months Well, that was. Well, it's not a good prediction. <laughs> in the no. sense that, you know, uh, it's not something to celebrate about, right? Uh, but uh, I did win a friendly bet with YB Kui, and he had to pay me 50 ringgit. <laughs> so that's the story. Uh, but uh, Trump, what it means is uh, what's the impact of Trump's victory for Malaysia? Oh, one thing we know for certain uh, with Trump pulling back mostly foreign policy uh, solutions for Asia or abandoning Barack Obama's pivot to Asia policy uh, what we'll see is a withdrawal of US interest back to US isolationist policies which means for the next five years, uh, four years of the, the future administration of Trump, they will be focusing primarily on domestic growth so uh, the only way they can do it, if they want to cut taxes which is what I heard Trump wants to do, they want to cut tax for the rich as well, then they have to cut the, def def the defense budget. If they cut the defense budget, uh, then the influence of America in Southeast Asia and Asia Pacific will generally diminish, allowing China to gain more foothold. So what we've already seen uh, Najib making more approaches to, um, to China, uh, this Trump election is going to push Malaysia even closer to China, I think, in the next four years. Now, the other impact that we've seen um, that worries everybody is that the ringgit has been tanking. Let's give proper context to it. It's not just the ringgit, the rupiah also has been tanking. In fact, all emerging markets have been tanking. Why do currencies drop? Currencies are based on a simple function of supply and demand. Yeah? So the Americans have, uh, not just Americans, a lot of people invest in Malaysia, uh, bringing in US dollars, and then they convert it to ringgit. Later, when they, when they exit the Malaysian market, they sell the ringgit and convert it back to US dollars. So what you're seeing is a lot, of, a lot of talk about a possible big volume of US well, ringgit being sold, converted into, into US dollars, and they are exiting the emerging markets. What we know is since 2008 financial crash, the Americans have gone into a quantitative easing uh, policy, what we call rock star, uh, rockstar uh, central bank policies, right? Where they just print more money 
uh, or basically what they do is they don't really physically print money. They convert uh, the, the the toxic assets into into cash essentially. Yeah. So the cash is used to buy up all these uh, toxic assets that they hold on to. That mostly back then in two thousand eight was property market. Uh, so all this easy money that is coming up went through the financial system into the emerging markets to push up stock markets and so on and so forth by bonds. Uh, with a Trump victory, I think it essentially means quantitative easing or printing of money will end very quickly and that rebuilding of America will start. So all this money is flowing back out heading towards America, causing the ringgit to drop. So those are the Trump consequences for Malaysia. The other one, of course, the big one is the TPP is dead. Hooray! <laughs> well, we're not anti-trade. We are anti the trade that is uh, being, being espoused by TPPA, mm. which is really not fair. Yeah. yeah? So, uh, so TPPA is dead. So those are the three things that will affect Malaysia. Of course, over time, we will develop as the, the administration clarifies its position. We'll give a, a second briefing on what Trump victory means to Malaysia. Now, very quickly, invoke dinner. We had the invoke dinner on Friday night. Yeah, that's right, Friday night. So, uh, you know, you know, I hope all of you who are watching this understand what Invoke is now. Uh, it's a volunteer-based movement to, to use uh, big data and use uh, scientific methodology to try to win election. So, uh, Rafizi uh, and his gang, and uh, Anna and also Mr. Toh, uh, who went around trying to sell uh, tables, we sold out 115 tables. That is fantastic. And I had to give a very long speech, about 40 minutes. Raf spoke for one and a half hours, I think, roughly. Um, because we were supposed to have another two speakers that dropped out. So we basically, it was a Raf and Wong Chen show <laughs> at the end of dinner. And, um, and we, we talked a lot. And, uh, you know, I think the one thing one thing about sharing a platform is Rafizi, you realize how insignificant you are compared to him. <laughs> I mean, I spoke for 40 minutes, but, you know, I had a lukewarm reception. Whereas the guy had a standing ovation, but what you like is, uh, we did raise about two hundred plus thousand. Oh, girls, you guys are too nice. You don't need to give me standing ovation. <laughs> so, so we, uh, yeah. So they, he did raise two hundred plus thousand. So that's good, and that's going towards Invoke, and Invoke is uh, driven by young people being paid peanuts. <laughs> so there is no markup. There is no issue about you know hanky panky deals. Everything is at cost. And everything is accounted for. So please continue to support your vote. Now, debates. Uh, I, uh, I did three debates uh, in the last three days. Yeah. In fact, no, on Friday I did two. Uh, and, and this morning I did one. Whoa. So yeah, three debates in a week. So uh, I did um, finance, which is what I'm supposed to shadow. So for those people who are always complaining about shadow government, I'm the shadow person for the shadow government for PKR on the matter of past, uh, matter of not past, matter of, matter of finance, <laughs> a matter of finance. And also, I have to shadow the commodities. And today, I have to shadow MITI, Minister of International Trade. So I gave three speeches. Uh, all speeches were about uh, an alarming drop in spending when it comes to uh, supplies and services. Yeah. So it can only mean one thing. I mean, the drops are really, really significant. I mean, I, I, when I presented my speech to Tan Sri Pandika Amit today, he was nodding along, agreeing with me. I mean, the cuts were like 75% on average, you know? So supplies and services are basically things such as buying pens and papers and hiring consultants who are giving services. Or if uh, someone comes and cut Najib's hair, that's a service rendered to Najib's hair, which is, as you all know, uh, very challenging to find a bit like Trump, <laughs> but uh, but generally supplies and services uh, suffered a seventy five percent cut uh, right across the board. Now, what does it mean? Does it mean that the government is really tightening tightening its belt, or is, does it mean that the happy happy days of free willing spending money is over? So, big questions to ask. The government may have tightened its belt or may have cut all this, but was the cut due to the fact that they were so uh, Corrupt before, yeah, or lots of wastage was before. So we shall we shall find out when the ministers finally give me a written reply on the issue. Now, on Saturday morning, I flew to Bali, not a holiday, <laughs> and uh, with expectation of having a bit of a break, but actually it was quite horrible. The flight was, <laughs> <laughs> the flight was three hours. I got up at six o'clock to catch the nine o'clock flight, right? 
got to the got to the airport, uh, took the train there, and you know I was like queuing up, getting ready. Then when you board the plane, it's three hours. I had a nap there. I got up, I walked out of the airport straight into uh, the the resort, which was quite nice. The resort, M- Malaya Hotel. Malaya, Bali, or they could, uh-huh. it had like coconut trees and stuff, but fancy. <laughs> yeah, but the, the sad thing is this I checked in the hotel at 1 o'clock, at 1 30, I had my lunch, uh, and then at 2 o'clock, it was conference all the way to 5. So after 5 o'clock, I had an hour where I strolled around the, the garden for a bit, uh, but it's kind of humid. Then 6 o'clock, we start again, and 6 to 9 30, we, uh, we had a really interesting uh, discussion. Uh, round table. Now there were about 40 M- members of parliament from Cambodia, Thailand, Myanmar, Malaysia, Indonesia, uh, where else? Timor Leste, mm, have I missed anybody? Singapore, Singapore had one representative. Uh, so we, we had a long chat and uh, we discussed a lot of issues. And the good news is, well, I don't know whether it's good or not, but I've been invited by the, by the Cambodian uh, opposition party. To, uh, to drop by Cambodia one day to teach them about uh, about drafting alternative budget. <laughs> yeah, I, I sent you. But you guys are not going, so I was like, maybe we'll send Tanya. <laughs> yeah, 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 okay, okay. Well, calm down, calm down. Yeah. So uh, they say they might invite me. That's all. So don't get too excited. Okay, but the okay. um, the Thai opposition as well, which is which is now Thailand is under military junta. So basically, every politician is an opposition. The uh, Thai opposition also uh, made me an offer to, to drop by advise them on certain issues. What is the, you yeah. famous boss? That's not famous lah. <laughs> it's just I get no audience here in Malaysia, so I should go export my channels overseas. <laughs> okay, last issue: Rafizi's trial. Um, uh, instead of going straight to parliament at 10 o'clock, which I don't have any questions to ask in the morning, I went to Rafizi's uh, trial. I was there at 9 o'clock. Rafizi came in like 10 o'clock, you know. Then uh, the the judge came in about 10.15, right? So it was like, uh, you know, you make me wait, I'll make you wait kind of thing. It's a bit childish, the whole process. But the judge went straight on to complain about Rafizi's uh, things. And he basically focused on the on this idea, not this this simple so-called evidence of Rafizi's press statement, where Rafizi said this document could be OSA, and that you know he understands the risk he's taking, so and so forth. The the judge took it as a as a confession of some sort. I'm not very not very technical on this issue, right? But uh, since I practice corporate law, I practice criminal law, so. Uh, but it seems a bit flimsy because uh, you are supposed to make judgment based on testimonies in court, not judgment on a video. Right. For instance, I could say that uh, this piece of paper is official secret site. I could very well believe to be. Yeah? But you know, me failing to understand it's actually not official secret site, my confession that this is an official secret site is not true. You still have to go down and ask the question whether this document is really. Uh, an official secrets document, and according to Gobin, uh, YB Gobin, who did a fantastic job, um, towards the end he just lost his temper. He was really quite, it's quite marvelous to watch Gobin lose his temper in parliament, but it's another thing to see him lose his temper in court. <laughs> it's quite, quite astounding. The, the crowd, which has been quite subdued because they sentenced stuff easy, broke into cheers. <laughs> I think it's, uh, it's very seldom that this happens. But, uh, but yeah, prognosis is not good for Raf, right? So it's 18 months for one sentence and another, another uh, 18 months for another charge. The only good thing is, of course, this, both 18 months are running concurrently. So Rafizi will, uh, will file uh, an official appeal. Uh, after the trial, he was, uh, I wouldn't say arrested, but he was escorted by policemen through the back lane into the lockup and into a holding pen at the, at the basement one. So um, the Wall Street Journal did, did a fantastic, uh, uh, you know, presence, and they recorded a lot of stuff, and um, lots of local papers, of course, uh, websites and all. So we, at one point, I think most of us were quite taken aback. We knew he was going to be, be um, you know, I think he was prepared to be to be sentenced. We were prepared for him to be sentenced. But to actually sit through the process where he is sentenced, when you actually you can prepare things, but when it, 
physically happens to you, it, it was quite touching and quite moving. So a lot of us were, were quite subdued. But uh, by about 1, 1 o'clock, 12.30, we paid his bail, he's out on bail, and uh, he went straight home to, to uh, see his son and to, to, to talk to his wife. So I think if we are lucky, we can, uh, you know, we're going to appeal. So you, the next step is from the Sessions Court, we'll go out to the High Court. And then after the High Court, if we lose that appeal, we'll go to the Court of Appeal. And I think these two processes, the earliest the government can move this is probably six months from now. So he has another six months of freedom. We hope that he, uh, the appeals will be successful. But in Malaysia, uh, hoping for miracle is quite hard. Yeah? Okay. So that's it. That's the intermission now. We're going to this. Oh, if you have yeah? any questions. Uh, yeah, if you have any questions, please post them now on Facebook because we will, we will answer questions after we do Policy Monday. But in the meantime, the two girls have to uh, do another another musical number. Perhaps you can stand here. No, like, no, 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 okay. Come on. Mysterious singer. Might be here. Nah. Yeah. Abby is not very shy. Yeah, Abby is yeah. not. Nadira, maybe. Yes, hi. I'm going to stand here. Okay, what are you guys going to sing next? Okay. Um, this song. <laughs> no, I don't. I'm yours. Oh, I, yeah, sure. I'm just, can you get in the, okay. the, the oh, frame? Okay, okay. Oh, okay. Yes. Uh, I'm not in the frame, right? No. No, no. Okay. No. okay. <laughs> Mysterious Nadira. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, ready? Okay, yeah. So I won't answer, no more, no more. It cannot wait. I'm yours, there's no need to complicate our time. It's short, this is our fate. I'm yours. Wow, that was good. Who <laughs> sang that song? Jason Mraz. Oh, I can't stand it. <laughs> I don't know, I'm just making it. I have no idea who Jason Mraz is. You know, one of the reasons why uh, why we, uh, we just, there's no connection with the young people is I don't understand your music at all. <laughs> okay, yeah, so here we go. Policy Monday. And uh, what, what's the time? How are we doing for time? It is now 7.50. Yeah, so we had a very long previously in Tuana Jaya, yeah. right? So we're going to do a short Policy Monday. Now, Policy Monday, we're going back to the very first uh, policy we talked about, which was corruption. Now, very few politicians want to talk about corruption, especially I want to talk today about uh, political party corruption. Now, I'm just trying to help the public out there. Yeah? Uh, the Trump's election uh, is basically tells you a story about anti-establishment. And this is a global phenomenon where people are just tired of politicians and they're also tired of political parties. right? What has happened is since, uh, we always blame Margaret Thatcher here, we just don't like her. <laughs> since neoliberalism and Margaret Thatcher uh, in, the, in the early 1980s, um, what we're seeing is the uh, so-called concept of neoliberal economics going in where corporations were taken care of. And when Margaret Thatcher lost power and, and uh, you know, Tony Black came in and all this, this belief in neoliberal economics continued. So what you were seeing is people talking about democracy and stuff, but in the on the ground, you were seeing greater and greater inequality between, of wealth between the people and the and the and the super rich. Yeah, uh, Naomi Klein, who I'm not a very big fan of, but I do read the stuff occasionally, uh, put up on a in a paper on uh, on the Guardian, and he called these people the so-called Clintons, Tony Blairs, and Obamas. The Davos crowd, <laughs> you know the people that go to Davos, mm -hmm. and and they so called represent democracy, but they do absolutely nothing, and all they do is they perpetuate the the, the corporate side. Now, to cut the long story short, how does this affect us all? Um, political parties are now being funded around the world by corporations. I don't think this that that is the same in Malaysia. Uh, that's not the that's not the case for at least the opposition. Corporations uh, treat us like the plague, right? But it doesn't mean that we cannot discuss what should be done. So if you want to keep political parties clean, and as a result, the politicians in political parties to be clean, we have to be uh, clever about analyzing the cost of running a political party, right? Uh, a lot of people, you know, they don't want to discuss this kind of thing. And I, I don't blame them, but you know, I'm a... Uh, I'm a rogue member of parliament, I suppose. <laughs> so I will tell it because I think it's important that uh, that people understand. 
Let's take a fictional political party. And we'll do some simple maths here. Let's start with a political party having a hundred thousand members. Okay? Now, assume that, uh, you know, to manage a hundred thousand members, you have to essentially send them a, a, an email or if you're a traditional, you send them a letter, right? A letter will cost you 60 cents for stamp, 20 cents for an envelope printing, another 20 cents, licking the stamp, so it's about sending out the thing, another few cents. Let's say it's one dollar per letter, okay? So that's 12 ringgit, right? 12 ringgit per person. True? You following me so far? Yeah? So it's 12 ringgit because you want to send one letter a month. And then, say, by the end of the year, you throw a conference or a convention where party members are invited and they come and have a good time, meet their MPs, meet their leaders, uh, you know, uh, have a bit of makan, maybe nasi lemak in the morning, some sort of simple chicken rice in the afternoon, okay. right, balloons, blah, 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 all that kind of thing, right? So that may cost another, what, 20 bucks? Let's say, right? let's say for simple argument, 20 bucks. So what we have today is total a grand total of thirty two dollars, twelve dollars for that licking letter stamp thing once a month, and then twenty bucks for a conference uh, end of year convention. So thirty two bucks. Okay. Let's say we give it another eight bucks because it's simpler to calculate. Huh? So we come to forty dollars per person. A hundred thousand members, active members. I, I'm not talking about fake members. Huh? Okay, active members to run a hundred thousand dollar organization with active members. You need basically forty dollars per person, right? So that is exactly four million. You need four million ringgit to run a, a party with one hundred thousand active members. Now, if you don't understand how much it is to run, then you cannot clean up the system. That's exactly. It. In addition to running day-to-day -day operations for a political party with a hundred thousand members. Right, they also have to run election every four to five years. Yeah, if the full term five years, if it's like you know, uh, sort of on the way to the full term, that's four years. So, if you have a hundred thousand members, you're likely going to contest something like 50 seats, I would imagine. Yeah, I don't add also parliament seats. Let's assume that for each seat, right, we're gonna spend a hundred thousand dollars, right. So that's basically 5 million. 5 million for the election. So every year, you have to set aside 1 million for election purposes. So after 5 years, you've got 5 million. You can contest 50 seats with 100,000 members. So, in truth, if you do want to match again, 4 million to run an organization, so you've got 4 million. 1 million you have to reserve for your, for your, for your election. So that is a grand total of 5 million a year. A political party, 100,000 members contesting in 50 parliamentary seats or slash adult seats will need 5 million a year. Okay? Now, raising 5 million a year uh, can be difficult, but it can also be quite easy to do. Right? Um, for instance, members of parliament in the opposition are already giving 20% of their revenue, of their earnings, Back to the party, uh, if you have, uh, I mean, it's quite substantial. You could actually raise about one million a year just on the contribution of party members. Now, your hundred thousand party members could give a nominal token contribution of ten dollars a year. That's another million. So, in actual fact, if the members of parliament and others who want seats give a million, the members themselves give a million, then the party needs to raise three million a year. In uh, developed countries. The government may just pay the three million directly to the political parties. This is where governments fund political parties. If you don't have that kind of system, then if you can raise a hundred thousand dinner uh, for for this big charama dinner thing, right? You essentially have to run thirty dinners a year, right? It's not that difficult to run thirty dinners if you have got lots of leaders, lots of MPs. You could run thirty dinners a year. You could do a charity auction. Uh, in my office, we raise about 50,000 a year just on doing movie night. Yeah. yeah. So it's all doable. What is not doable is a lot of political parties don't tell you how much they need a year. And when they don't tell you how much they need a year, politicians go and raise money and then, then comes the real problem. They don't give it to the party. 
Yeah. If someone goes around and raise 10 million a year, when the party needs 5 million a year, by default, you know that someone has pocketed 5 million. And that's where political corruption uh, comes in. And if political corruption comes in and secures the party, if this person with 5 million additional money uses the money to buy party members to get voted in to be a vice president, deputy, or whatever position he's seeking, then that's how the entire system is corrupted. When politicians are corrupted, when the political parties are also corrupted, the government and the opposition and everything, the culture of corruption then takes place. So therefore, this Policy Monday, uh, the lesson is simple. Don't be corrupt first. Second, if you want to fight corruption, you have to understand the needs of political parties and try to meet it through legal means. The moment you break this shroud of mystery about it and start analyzing it in an in, in orderly manner, right? Uh, then you will start to understand what uh, these kind of things are not too difficult to raise and that it should be totally above board and then that's how we start the revolution to remove corruption in Malaysia. Okay, so that's my policy Monday gripe about uh, political corruption and political parties. Uh, next week we'll talk about something else. Okay, give us uh, another song. Oh, oh. Yeah, intermission. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, practice. Yeah, practice. Yeah, yeah, practice. Yeah, practice. Yeah, practice. How about a CD song for my kids? I, we don't have a CD song. Oh. What do you mean you don't have a CD song? <laughs> okay, okay, let's do the lazy song. Okay, sure, sure, sure. And come into the screen here. Yeah. Abigail yeah, is not shy. <laughs> Just imagine Nadira is somewhere there. I am somewhere here. <laughs> 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 She's more Chinese than me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. okay, right. Oh, right, yes. Today I don't feel like doing anything. I just want to lay in my bed. Don't feel like picking up the phone. So leave the message at the tone. Today I don't feel like doing anything. Nothing at all. Okay. <laughs> I don't know who sang that as well. Bruno Mars. Who? Bruno Mars. Bruno Mars? I don't, I don't like Bruno Mars. I don't know who Bruno Mars is. <laughs> I don't yeah. Bruno. Anyway, I don't like the theme of that song. <laughs> okay, yeah, okay. That's, that's just being lazy. I hope you guys yes, have not been sleeping and not answering calls today. No, no, no. no. <laughs> it's just easy to harmonize. Actually. Okay, okay then. We're into Q&A. Yes, so, Tanya, yeah. look. Give me some questions today. Question one. Question one. With a Trump presidency, do you think the DOJ suit will die a slow death or be even be under even more scrutiny? I don't know. I mean, the MO1 or AKA uh, Najib Razak. Okay, MO1 seems to say that uh, they're really good buddies and that he's got a signed signature of a photo from Trump saying that That's you're my favorite nice. prime minister. The question is, when did he sign that? <laughs> and what state was he in when he signed that? Um, I think, okay, I think um, uh, Nanji has been really lucky with DOJ because his name has not been published and uh, I don't know whether it's lucky or not because having a ridiculous uh, mystery MO1 actually could be even more detrimental to him, right? Because then everybody's guessing and talking about it. Uh, but generally we know that Obama and Nanji are good friends and they remain good friends. So uh, I don't think they're going to get a better, more understanding president from the U.S. that is sympathetic to Najib going forward. So I don't see Trump uh, Trump trumping Obama on being best friends with Najib. Uh -huh. uh, what we know for certain is uh, our Prime Minister, God bless him, uh, <laughs> uh, is, uh, is, is going around trying to smooch up with the Chinese and you know, that's good for him, right? Because in a, in a harsh world of today, we all need friends. Yeah. Amen. So yeah. So I don't think the DOJ thing is gonna give him a break with with Trump. Um, we shall see. We shall see. Next question. Okay. Um. I guess you touched on it a bit in your answer in your um previous in Clara Jaya, but someone wants to know what's what's next given Rafizi's impending jail term. Okay. What's next is important. I mean, um, Rafizi has been building up in both. You know, our co-sponsors, collaborators, yeah. and funders. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, the, the thing about Rafizi, he does plan a lot ahead and, and he knows uh, he knows that it's, it's almost inevitable that he will end up in jail. So, uh, what he's done is he's empowered a lot of young people 
Uh, it's been very hard on them. They've been working non-stop. A lot of them felt sick. But, uh, but this is what we call really tough love. I mean, if he's got six months more, he needs to get these young people involved better already. And I need all of you out there who's watching this with, uh, you know, with, uh, with a bit of money, please support them. You know, you can subscribe for 50 bucks uh, a year, 100 bucks a year. If you're really generous, you can go for the $1,000 a year package. But do give money for, for, for Rafizi's uh, dream. Should he go to jail, at least uh, invoke will continue under the um, under the power of these young people uh, who are who are not corrupted, who are clean, who are very idealistic, and at the same time being guided by by more senior members like like myself and a few others to make sure that they are on the right path and uh, and that they can become an effective fighting machine when the election comes around. Okay, okay. another question. Yes. Um, so, what is your view on the statement that PKR and the opposition should align with China rather than the West? PKR align with China and the West? Rather than the West. Well, um, personally, I, I don't think PKR has, has actually sat down to discuss about China, so to speak. Um, but I think we should engage the, the, the Chinese embassy as soon as possible. And we do engage them. I mean, we, we occasionally, of course, some of our party members uh, go and have a chat with them. The same way we have chats with the British and the Americans and the Australian and the Japanese, so on and so forth. Uh, so, my view is this. Uh, China historically has not been a, a, a sort of like a colonial power. So, I tend to take the view that history do not change drastically. Uh, it's culturally uh, a, a cultural Chinese practice not to conquer another country and subjugate them to, to religious or to economic issues. What we see is historically the Chinese wants, uh, wants respect, they want to trade, and they want you to count out to them. Yeah? So in that sense, they are less aggressive than the West. So they are a better, uh, better superpower, I think so. Yeah? And in, in uh, Africa, in more recent times, of course, Chinese have been going to Africa for about 15 years now. And the West have been there for 120, 130 years since colonial days. What the Chinese have done economically for Africa is pretty incredible. It's, it, in that 15 years, they have surpassed the entire 120 years of colonial rule for Africa. So again, uh, they are not a democracy. They are still a communist state. Uh, but uh, at least there's no real hypocrisy in the issue. You know, as the West will talk about uh, helping you, giving you aid and all kind of thing, at the same time they continue to exploit you. The Chinese are not giving free lunches, but they, uh, they tend to, to deliver a bit more in terms of development for, for Africa. So, so we should see, I mean, of course, uh, investing in Africa for China might be a different strategy as to try to get greater influence in the South China Sea and also South Asia. Uh, so the way forward is really to keep your eyes open, to engage, and to try and understand. And a last issue, what I what I really feel is, China is trying to rewrite the rules on what corporate responsibilities are. Uh, many people about five six years ago when we started this path of sustainability issues, you know, certification and and uh, and standards, um, we thought that Chinese would be just not that interested in this kind of thing. But they have come very quickly to, to adopt them, very, very quickly. So I think the old corporate model of uh, Anglo-American co corporate model uh, is probably going to be surpassed by some sort of new Chinese corporate model. So what we need to do is quickly get in there early and make sure that the corporate elements of a corporate China has to consider sustainability, human rights, labor rights, and stuff like that. So if we engage them early, we could actually shape some of these policies for them. Okay? Yes. Okay, more personal questions and a fun one now. Where are your Harry Potter spectacles? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, well. <laughs> yeah, that, some people ask me today in Parliament, I, well, I, well the, the story is this. I don't know to wear them. <laughs> I, I actually have two pairs of glasses. I have the Harry Potter one, which I don't like to refer to Harry Potter, I actually I refer to John Lennon. <laughs> And I have these super light ones. They're like super, super light. The Harry Potter ones are really heavy. Uh, so at home, I tend to wear the super light one. So uh, so I'm going to work because everybody recognizes me that. So I usually wear that. 
and then I'll take it off and then go home at about 5, 6 o'clock and then I'll wear that and then today I mixed it, mixed it up I went, <laughs> went straight to send my kids to school I didn't realize I was wearing these glasses until I was in the car then by then it was too late, too late to, to use that to change my glasses oh. and uh, you know I've been in, in, I went to court and then I went to parliament and then I came straight to work here so I haven't been back now to change back to, uh, to my round glasses but next week I will be back to the slash your leather glasses. Okay, do you have a last one? I think we're, quite, we're running yeah. quite late. Yep, last one. So even as an armchair observer, it's quite disheartening to see the way that the way things are going in Malaysia. So what keeps people like you and Rafizi motivated? Because we need some of your fire. Okay, okay, very, very simple. Look. Um, first, this is a profession. And, uh, and I come from a professional background as a corporate lawyer. So we treat this member of parliament thing not really so much as a vanity issue, even though we do love adulation. <laughs> We're only human. But, uh, but we do treat it as a, as a professional uh, thing where I'm being paid to do my job, so I should deliver the best that I can. So if the laws are being put on, on in parliament for debate, I have to scrutinize the lawyer like a, the, the laws like a proper lawyer and to do my research and to go in there and do it. So if you treat something professionally, you should get uh, you should be inspired to do better. You know, if you enjoy your work, and I do enjoy my work. Yeah, the, the I think there's there's of course hardship, there's strain on 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 the on the missus and the children. You know, but um, we do generally enjoy the work. So uh, for you to get on to do your thing, always pick something that you're happy to do, and you'll be motivated. Now, most of you should be happy doing something to fight the government. <laughs> okay. Yeah. You should be you should be happy the fact that you're contributing towards the the fall of very corrupt regime. Uh, so for that, please go to invoke, and I have to stress this over and over again. Become a volunteer in invoke, and you might find happiness there. Yeah, uh, I think does it answer the question? Sort of. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so that's it for for. Okay, last one. It's just a yes and no question. Okay, sure. sure. Um, will we see you and your team in Bursay Five? <laughs> of course we'll be there. Uh, well, the, the, the team has been invited to come over to my house where I shall try to teach the girls to cook uh, shepherd's pie. <laughs> which, is what, which is what I'm quite good at cooking shepherd's pie. It's quite easy. So they are supposed, Tanya is supposed to, uh, Tanya, Nadira and also Abigail are supposed to be at my house at 9.30 yeah. and uh, go and buy everything and then you know mash the potatoes, make the pie and we shall eat and feast at 11.30 and by 12 o'clock we'll be at the birthday and we hope to see all of you there we'll of course be going to support in book <laughs> which means we have to we will meet you there to sign you up because you know birthday is a rock star concert it's a one day thing yeah. in book is like a marathon mm. so if you're going to attend this rock star thing and we're going to try and convert you into a marathon runner as well and the in okay so i see you all there and uh, have a pleasant week ahead Thank you so much. Bye. 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 Honey, you're off this thing. <laughs> you just click stop streaming.